good morning, everybody. I'm Jamie Greco. I'm one of the product managers for AWS Managed Services, um, also known as AMS. And this is Matt Demich. He's head of solutions architecture for Thomson Reuters. Um, how many of you have heard of AMS? Oh, nice. Good. How many of you have heard of Thomson Reuters? And don't raise your hand if you work there. <laughs> Ah, OK. Nice, nice. Um, well, by the end of the presentation, um, for those of you that don't know, you'll learn a little bit about both. Um, so today, Matt and I are going to take you through TR's journey to the AWS cloud um, in the face of their data center eviction. Uh, so Matt will go in detail about their journey. I just would like to get a show of hands how many people are actually just starting their journey to migrate to AWS cloud. Just starting? OK. How many are? like well along the way. Anybody all in? Nice. Anybody still unsure of what AWS Cloud is? OK, that's good. If anybody raised their hand, we were going to have to talk after the session. Um, great. OK, um, <clears throat> so by the end of the presentation, you're going to get a little bit of a flavor of a journey to the cloud and all different levels of maturity. So from cloud needed to lift and shift to just like accelerating migration as fast as possible. Um, so you're in the right place regardless of where you're at with your cloud migration. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt uh, to start taking you through their story. Thanks, Jamie. Oh, hot. Oh, my fault. There you go. Thanks. All good. Um, so to tell, start telling my story, uh, I'm going to go back a couple years to 2016. Thomson Reuters was just starting out on a cloud-native journey. And we uh, were about 47,000 employees and organized into several different lines of businesses. And we started out with just a cloud native strategy of building new applications, greenfield development only. Uh, so we didn't have this lift and shift um, or, or mass migration kind of view right away. Uh, we were really in enjoying the cloud native goodness uh, that we get that comes with that. Immutable infrastructure with infrastructure as code, taking advantage of the auto scale um, elements of the cloud, and cost optimizing our architectures. Uh, we're really enjoying that. We uh, were humming along, and, uh, and we actually shared that story at reInvent the last uh, couple years. So in 2016 and 17, we shared how we developed a multi-account landing zone strategy and how we secured and governed um, our cloud processes. So we were going along with cloud native strategy and then in January of 2018, the company announced that we were gonna divest a large portion of it, a, a one of our largest business units, uh, effectively splitting us in half. This split um, then led us into our third iteration of sharing our story, which is what do you do when your company splits in half uh, from, with your landing zones? And so with that one, we dug into, all right, we have our landing zones, we have different applications running in those landing zones, now we need to separate as a company, what do we do? That led us to then the question that I wanna uh, share the story about today, which is now what do we do with the applications that are running in our divested company's data centers? So as Jamie said, my name is Matt Dimmich. I head the solutions architecture team at Thomson Reuters. If you haven't heard of Thomson Reuters, we provide news and information and tools to the legal, tax and accounting, compliance, government and media markets. I myself work in a centralized group within Thomson Reuters called Infrastructure Hosting and Networks, or IHN for short. And we help work with all of our lines of business on cloud best practices, cloud tooling, and uh, strategy for getting to the cloud. So to set up the challenge with these applications that we're running in our divested company's data center, we started out by creating TSAs or transitional service agreements. So we had two years contractually to keep those dependencies on each other uh, before we had to be completely separated. The application scope was over 300 applications and over 10,000 servers. In addition to splitting our landing zones, our company uh, centralized teams got split too, as you can imagine. So teams like our Cloud Center of Excellence and our data center operation teams were almost split in half, leaving less people to do the same work. At this point, we took the opportunity to merge our Cloud Center of Excellence teams and our data center operations teams. Previous to this, they were separate for about two to three years. 
uh, which brings us to our first lesson learned of the, of the presentation. Merging our data center technology and cloud center of excellence teams led to flexible resourcing to really adapt to our migration needs. But I'll get into a little bit more of that later. So when we looked at the holistic problem and the cloud strategy we had right now, we had a cloud native strategy, uh, re-architecting uh, 300 applications in two years uh, to be fully cloud native, we knew, we knew right away that was not in scope. So we had to look at a different strategy. So as we looked at a different cloud strategy, we knew that we needed to accelerate our migration. We knew that we needed to empower our people to execute those migrations. In our data centers today, we had upwards of about 170 different services that our data center operations teams used to manage our infrastructure. And we knew that we needed to do that in the cloud somehow. And that was dramatically different in our cloud native estate. Our business didn't stop during this migration phase, unfortunately. So we still had ongoing security and compliance uh, needs that we needed to manage. Ultimately, we wanted to avoid distraction of the lift and shift and keep focusing on growing our products and making them better for our customers. So at the end of the day, we really needed to answer this question. How do we migrate quickly, stay security neutral or better, and not bring some of our legacy or proprietary technology to the cloud with us? As we looked at changing the strategy, we found a partner that could help us in the spots that we were the most challenged and the ones that we didn't want to invest in. And with that, I will invite Jamie back to tell you more about Amazon Managed Services. Thanks. Try not to skip the slide this time. Okay. Um, so for those of you that don't know about AMS or AWS Managed Services, we operate our customers' infrastructure in the cloud for them. Um, so it's a great... Uh, it's a great partnership when you have companies such as Thomson Reuters that's faced with migrating you know, tens of thousands of servers over to the cloud in such a short time. Um, so we do the day-to-day -day infrastructure management. Uh, we manage a secure and compliant landing zone uh, on behalf of our customers, do the infrastructure management. Um, included, uh, included in that is incident response, um, automations for monitoring and learning. We do a full change management process. Um, to keep compliance in the account. And then we also uh, do things like cost optimization, um, patch management, backup, anything you can think of that you would do on a normal day-to-day -day basis for your infrastructure, we manage that for you. Um, so all that sounds wonderful, but I bet most of you are asking, like for a company like TR that was already mature and they had a cloud native strategy, they were building and operating in AWS already, why would they need somebody like AMS to come in? Um, the problem that we were trying to solve for TR was going back to their original question. How do they migrate 10,000 plus servers in two years? And how do they answer that question? How do they accelerate their migration, stay security neutral or better, and not bring over any of the uh, technical debt that they had in their legacy data center. Um, so together with TR, we provided the day-to-day -day operations and some additional tooling that allowed them to accelerate that migration and meet to meet their timelines and to get to where they ultimately wanted to go, which is modernization. Um, they didn't want to focus, they don't want to stay in just a lift and shift model where they're just lifting, shifting everything over into AWS, but they really wanted to get to a point where they could modernize their applications. Oops. Thank you. So as we got started, we knew we needed a strategy to help with uh, these application teams that were migrating their, um, their workloads. And we needed that default answer from a migration strategy perspective. So we put together a framework based on Gartner's five R's for migrating to the cloud. When we look at that, rebuild and revise um, or a cloud native approach is something that we had experience. We we're very familiar with that. Now we knew we needed to look into the cloud ready ours, which would be more like refactor or rehost. We get a lot of advice to start and look at bit for bit migrations to greatly accelerate our migration, meaning we would copy exactly what was in our data center out to the cloud. And we uh, very quickly started hitting a lot of pitfalls with that approach based on the wide variety of applications that we had. So Thomson Reuters, um, with the applications that we had in scope, largely grew by acquisition. 
So the architectures and the patterns and all of the things that were running in these data centers um, were not very homogeneous. Uh, we had a lot of different challenges to deal with. As we realized, one, one example um, of a pitfall with these bit-for-bit -bit migrations is we have a lot of Windows shared storage. And when you start looking at copying things out, those shared storage stories um, get really hard to just work in automatically. So then we started shifting. The, the bit for bit falls more into the rehost category. So we started to shift more towards the refactor. And we realized that we could do some minimum viable refactoring along the way. And now, make no mistake, this was a time-bound project, right? 300, over 300 applications in two years is a lot of work. And so we had to be really focused on, on acceleration. However, uh, we found with all of the pitfalls of a bit-for-bit -bit approach, this minimum viable refactoring, this refactor approach was really attractive. And one example of that is updating our operating systems. If you run into data center for a number of years, you probably have a variety of old, older legacy operating systems. This gave us the opportunity to try and upgrade those. There were two benefits as we kind of took this minimum viable refactoring approach. One, very clearly, a security, our security posture increases as we are upgrading those operating systems and actually getting the chance to do that. And two, it also funneled in and kind of consolidated the number of versions of operating systems we had. And that was consistent across a number of different areas. So that brings us to our next lesson learned. The, de the decision between refactor and rehost becomes your migration approach. There is a different skill set needed between rehost and refactor. And that's something you need to know up front to prepare for your migration. In addition to that, if you change that approach in the middle of your migration, that has another, you have to understand the impacts that that creates for your staff and the skill sets that they have. So to accelerate even more, we made a, a number of significant changes across people, process, and technology. And we started with people. In order for the program to be successful, we need to do, enable our people to be successful. And we did this with two ways. We did it with organizational change, and we did it with program changes. So looking into how our organization changed, I alluded to consolidating our data center operations and Cloud Center of Excellence teams, and now I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. We all love to think that orgs shouldn't matter. We should be able to work across teams really fluently uh, to accomplish a goal, and in many ways we do. But in this big of a program, um, consolidating those two teams helped so much because we needed a variety of expertise in each of these migrations. And we needed expertise in operating systems from our data center team, but also cloud practices. So really, it, it uh, bridged the two teams together, and we needed that knowledge from both places. So having it in one team, prevented that, hey, can I have some resources from your team conversation, and just more fluidly, the team was able to rally around the biggest priority of the day. The other opportunity and, and reason why this consolidation was helpful is it allowed some of our employees to upskill where they wanted to, um, as our future is cloud. On the program change side, we started with a very centralized view of this. Um, we worked with different partners, we got different advice, and it's really easy to think, okay, if I have application teams that are developing my products, I want to keep them on that. I don't want to distract them with a lower business value. Um, you know, if it's not, if our customers aren't going to see a difference, let's just centralize that and have one team, uh, maybe a migration factory, go through and do all of the migrations for us. And we very quickly saw that we needed to change that. And so we moved from a central to a more distributed model. We empowered our portfolio owners, our application teams, to take the reins and drive their migration. And we did that not by just saying, hey, it's your job, but we did that by giving them support from IHN as well. And we did that in a number of different ways. One, we gave them resources. So we gave them people that could help a um, through a variety of processes, from discovery to post-migration operations. We gave them um, technologies. And at the end of the day, we gave them training. A lot of the teams hadn't seen cloud yet. Some came from the cloud native background that I talked about before. And so we established a training path that no matter where they were at, kind of brought them up to speed on, hey, what is Amazon Web Services? What is AMS? And what is TR's cloud strategy on top of all of that? So 
So we distributed our migration responsibilities, but we also saw that there was a need to have a central leadership function. And so we did that by creating a steering committee. That steering committee was made up of members from all of our different lines of businesses. And it really enabled us in two different ways. Number one, when you have a program with the number of people and the number of applications that we had, it's very, it's very easy for different pockets to go off on a different strategy. This steering committee allowed us to keep on the same strategy and have a common forum for any st proposed strategy changes. Because if we weren't mar marching in the same direction, it was very easy to get um, held up and slowed down. The other thing um, that came, became critically important was an escalation point. Um, the number of activities that happen all at once when you have to all of a sudden up and move and, and do a migration like that were overwhelming. And if you didn't have an escalation point, it wasn't necessarily uh, you're complaining about uh, somebody not doing X, Y, and Z. It was to establish priorities. Otherwise, everything is priority one and nothing gets done. That brings us to our next lesson learned. Get the right people involved. The people with the knowledge need to be the owners of your migration. So once we empowered our people, then we needed to give them the processes and tools to further enable their success. So we developed several new processes. And very quickly, um, upon developing these four new processes, we learned a couple things. Number one, when you're developing new processes for something like this, get started with an MVP and iterate from there. Don't wait until it's all completely finalized to get started, because it's gonna have to change over time. And second, a defined escalation point in every single process that you create is critically important. Otherwise, the same thing happens. Everything becomes a priority one, and the program will not stay on track. So the first process that we dove into was discovery. So we already had a discovery process for cloud native. We were used to working with that for several years. We knew we needed to change, one, change it for cloud ready, so we came up with a new process. Now discovery at Thomson Reuters and for this program consisted both of discovering, okay, what applications do we need to move, what servers, what technologies, what dependencies does it have, all of the normal discovery stuff, but also led into, okay, now what's the implementation pattern for that particular dependency. We did this by scaling up a centralized solutions architecture team that worked with each application team on their migration plan. This had a couple of effects. We got to easily guide people towards new standards that maybe were a little bit different than what we're running in our data centers. We uh, helped prevent delays based on teams that didn't have cloud experience yet. We were able to bring that experience, partner with them to create their migration plan while they can also upskill on the cloud. And so it allowed us to get started faster. This brings us to our next two lessons learned. Discovery is absolutely critical, and anything that you miss in discovery is gonna slow you down in migration. But coupled with that, discovery is never perfect. So plan for the wrong information in your migration plan, or in your migration process. Our processes constantly change throughout the whole program. We've been running the program for a year, just over a year, and they've changed almost every month. Throughout the discovery process, we also identified architectural patterns that applied to many of the applications. That centralized solutions architecture team was critical in this space too. So we developed a process as we were working through these migration plans to document and communicate those all in one spot. For these patterns, they are often implemented actually by our central IHN team. An example of this is database. Our IHN team supports databases in our data centers, and now they're gonna support databases in AMS. And so building the architecture and standing up that database was something that our IHN team did, but our application teams were dependent on it. So very quickly, as you discover new patterns, and if they tend to be implemented by a centralized team, and they're dependent on a bunch of application teams, uh, you can see how it could quickly become a bottleneck as you get started, because these need to be flushed out and operationalized before you can actually do a production cutover. 
And so we learned a, a, a critical lesson in this area too. And this was transparency is absolutely key when developing patterns that are dependencies of application migrations. It sounds super obvious, but I promise you when you're in the thick of a migration and you're pushed for time, documenting patterns and work items and linking dependencies is not the top of your mind. And we really suffered as a result of this. The way that we suffered is application teams knew they needed a database. They knew that our team was building it. And so they would go right to the developer that they knew was working on it and ask for status updates. That means our developers who are heads down are getting a context switch um, constantly and worried about dates and, and split brain from, from the work that we're actually asking them to do. Once we kind of stopped for just a pause for a second, got organized around the dependencies and made it all visual with our application migration dates, the chaos uh, settled down quite a bit. But just another example how um, a simple thing that sounds obvious, um, you, you really need to um, consider that and pause and, and get organized before you start your migration. An example of a pattern that was a success was also a database. I wanted to share that, how it ties into the minimum viable refactoring approach that we took. And that was with um, in creating a Microsoft SQL pattern in an AMS environment. So our, our team came up with the pattern, and we knew that we had a variety of database versions throughout the 300 or more apps. And we didn't want to go stand up several, you know, 20 different versions of MS SQL. And so we started with upgrading to SQL 2016. And that is the pattern, and we had a uh, standalone pattern that was just like a single node. We had a highly available pattern within a region that had a clustered approach. And then we had a, what we called HA plus DR, which had cross-region replication built in. And this was all with SQL 2016. So pushing that back into the discovery and our solutions architecture team, as we worked with new applications and they would come with a legacy SQL version, we would say, can you, op can you upgrade to 2016? Let's go try it out. And as we worked through them with several of those applications, they're like, yeah, it, it works because our database is simple. And with several of our applications, it didn't work. And they're like, no, we still need this older version. So then our next iteration of that was, okay, can we do this with compatibility mode? We can, we can keep the architecture of the SQL database that we had, but we'll just flip on the compatibility mode. We'll go back. And we did over 90% over of our application migrations were able to be upgraded to the same architecture because of that kind of consistent, minimum viable refactoring approach. So all of that to be said, as your, um, the work it takes to develop a new pattern, work out an architecture, get it, a, a team lined up to implement it, versus, hey, can you use this new version? Uh, here's the pattern that we already have proven. We already have done it for several other applications. That meant that discovery and infrastructure creation got way more efficient as time went on in our project. Migration plans in that case, like the actual discovering and then putting together the diagram of what that's gonna look like in AWS, went from taking like a month of elapsed time to just a couple weeks. Equally important as discovery and patterns is also the operations process. Now we did this in parallel. We had different work streams, divide up, coming up with the discovery process and the operations process. It's not something that your application teams are gonna go ask for. In Thomson Reuters, it was largely, uh, their application developers might not know all of the work that goes in to operationalizing our data centers. And so it's not something that early in your migration is gonna become obvious that you need to do. But the amount of work to really flush out your processes, because that's a critical step to do a production cutover, is actually, is actually quite robust. So even though AMS took care of a lot of the day-to-day -day infrastructure management, we still had processes that we needed to update, like incident change management, how to do lifecycle management, how to do patching. AMS was a great partner and did the patching for us, but we still needed to define the patching maintenance windows and how that was gonna roll through our applications. Another nice part is app teams are enabled, but not required to take on more of the responsibility. So this is a nice natural stepping stone to a cloud native approach. 
What I mean by that is IHN in our data centers creates the infrastructure for app teams and delivers it to them. In an Amazon managed services environment or a cloud ready environment, we have that capability as well. You can go to our same team, it will stand up infrastructure for you. Or some of our teams that had been cloud native were very comfortable with the self-service nature of the cloud. They could come right to Amazon managed services and sign up their own infrastructure. The other call out in the operations processes is a mindset change when you're looking at ITSM processes. For us, we were very comfortable with our CMDB and ServiceNow. With on-prem, we had every switch, router, and VM um, in there, dependencies mapped as best we could. But when we moved to the cloud, those configuration items become the cloud application instead of that server. So you have to map the, the chunk of the work here as you update your operations process is mapping incidents against those cloud applications instead of a server. There's a lot of um, training that needs to happen. So once you have that process, those processes down, you have to train, train, train every application team that's gonna run this workload and get them on the same page. The other thing that, um, that happens is, and why this is so important, is it, it tends to get overlooked, and then the moment that there's an incident, then it becomes very clear, and we had that happen a couple times. We, we put the team through training, an incident happens, and, the, and they're all over the place for an incident management, and it just underscores the importance of getting this and communicating it. So that leads into training, and it leads into our next lesson learned. Training sessions prior to a game day are essential, otherwise the game days become training. So we had two ways that we trained people. One was, you have to do the basics, right? Uh, I know how to SSH to my box in the data center, now how do I do that in an Amazon managed service environment? But then we had game days which actually exercised our incident and change management processes to show teams and, and to develop that muscle memory on how to, how to do those. And you can imagine a three hour game day when um, the team didn't pay attention during training and now everybody's sitting there for three hours watching somebody SSH to a server, it becomes a lot less valuable than it would have been. All right, moving on to migration. We knew that our migration process needed to follow a very similar approach to our discovery process, which was distributed. We did uh, business as usual migrations right away, meaning our application teams would bundle in a migration activity in their backlog in the same sprint that they would go develop a new feature. And we learned very quickly that doesn't work. Um, you know what's gonna be prioritized, it's gonna be the new feature, it's not gonna be the migration activity. And that stretched migration activities out over a long period of time and took just more combined time between all of the teams that were there to help do the migration. So we came up with a process that was a little bit more focused and a little more systematic and it still didn't really click in, people still didn't engage right away. And so then we came up with something called the cohort model, that's what we called it, which really what it means was getting people in a room to execute a migration, getting all of the people that you need in a room to execute a migration. Our solutions architect that helped with discovery was in the room, the application team, the operations team, the database team, all in a room for a week or two weeks to execute that actual migration cutover. That was dedicated focus and time. It went very well with the distributed model of empowering our teams to have responsibility on the deadlines and drive, uh, drive the processes forward with our support. And for us, the benefits far outweighed the cost. We flew people all over the globe to do these cohorts and they were so successful. So that brings us to our next lesson learned, which is there's no substitute for getting people in the same room to accomplish a goal. Now, we have certain cases, network was kind of an example of this, where there's not a lot for the network team to do. A lot of that has been flushed out. And where we had dependencies like that where they didn't need to be actively engaged in the migration cohort, they were lifelines. And so it was a defined time. They knew a cohort was going on and they were ready to have a call at any uh, point in the day to get past a hurdle. The other thing that we learned is pushing more of the migration activities up front allowed us to focus more on the app deployment 
and all of those unknowns that I talked about during the cohort. So we ended up standing up all of our infrastructure as a prerequisite to a cohort. So all of the servers were up and running in AMS before we flew people together to focus on the deployment. In some cases, there were lots of knowledge gaps in these applications as a result of an organization shuffling and shifting around because of the split. And that's just an, a natural reality of a lot of these types of migrations. And so by getting that upfront done, it allowed that, info, that, that focused time uh, to work through those unknowns. So by pulling this, um, okay, once we look at that migration process, and we actually established it and start exercising it, then you look at, okay, how can we accelerate the migration overall even more? And the next bottleneck is the process of how fast you can get that discovery information converted into infrastructure. And that's not only just for creating it for the first time, but like I said, you're gonna have wrong information, so how can you quickly iterate when you find the wrong information about the infrastructure? So we empowered our people, we furthered and enabled them with processes, uh, but we knew, again, looking at the calendar, that wasn't gonna be enough either. We needed to move faster. So now that we've dealt with those, now the key was looking at technology automation. We started noticing very early on that actually creating the infrastructure took weeks. And again, it was for a similar reasons, whether that's manual change requests into AMS, where some of our developers are used to the cloud native having a little bit more control, and some of it is because we didn't know everything about our applications. Landing zones were also a bottleneck. In AMS, you create your own account, and then you hand it over to AMS, and then they create their own landing zone within it. And so that process together takes time. And when you're doing a global deployment of a large number of applications, that upfront task of defining what regions are you gonna be in, what size do your subnets need to be to accommodate all those applications is one of the things you can't iterate on very well, right? You can't change that easily. And for us, it was extra important because IP space we had non-overlapping IP space and that was at a premium at the time. So developers are frustrated, landing zones are struggling to be created, um, developers aren't understanding why they have to wait for RFCs to, to complete, and just in general, we weren't feeling that we had the velocity um, that we needed. So that's when we turned to AMS and just described our challenges. So, uh, like we've mentioned, AMS has been working with TR for over a year now, working very closely with their migration. Um, as you've heard many times this week, and I'm sure over the course of your experience with AWS, we're very, very customer focused. But when you're in a situation like with AMS where we're managing day-to-day -day infrastructure management for our customers, we have to be even more customer focused and almost integrated with our customers. We have to be very aware of what's going on every day, not only with their migration, but just on an ongoing running and production basis. Um, so our focus was understanding what TR was facing, what opportunities they had, what issues they were having um, throughout their entire process. And being that close with TR and just really into, in, in the mix with them, being an integrated part of their team, uh, we were able to develop new features, new feature sets within AMS that was helped them accelerate their migration. Um, one of the features that we developed was something called developer mode. So in AMS, you have a secure and compliant landing zone that we operate for you. Along with that becomes a robust change management process that you follow. Just like you do on-prem or in other cloud or if just following your normal SDLC, change management is important, especially when you need to be compliant and secure. Um, so throughout the migration, our change management process was slowing them down a little bit. They were getting frustrated. They would have to submit, submit requests for changes for standing up infrastructure, for changing security groups, and for doing things in a non-production environment just to get their infrastructure ready to do their migration, ready for their cohorts, ready for training. Um, so just listening to the frustrations, looking at the opportunity that we had um, with TR and trying to figure out how to help them accelerate, we created something called developer mode that really loosened the controls in that non-production environment 
all gave them native API access, um, allowed them to iterate more quickly on their infrastructure designs throughout the migration. Um, and that's not something that we did just for TR. Everything that we learn from our customers and all the features that we develop, we actually deploy to all of our customers. That's something that everybody can take advantage of. Um, and we're very, very proud to be able to work with them and, and really see um, and learn from their experiences. Um, so I'll let Matt turn it back over to Matt. He'll talk you a little bit more through how that impacted their migration. Thanks. So developer mode meant then that instead of going to the AMS console, because you get a separate console, to create an RFC, we could get direct access to the AWS console to iterate extremely quickly when our app team said, yeah, the port between the load balancer and your application is this, but that wasn't actually true. Uh, we could work through those very quickly. So that was like minutes instead of hours or days. That was a huge game changer for us. We could iterate so much more quickly, and it showed incredible partnership on Amazon Managed Services side. So that brings us to our lessons learned. Automation is a key enabler, but people and process are equally as important. So have a partner that can adapt and evolve quickly to meet your needs. The other thing that won't come to, uh, come to you as a surprise is that automation technology uh, was a big enabler. Uh, we have a couple of examples that I wanna share around that. Um, the first is with the landing zone automation I talked about. So because of our cloud native strategy and we were used to um, automating the creation of new AWS accounts for our company, we were able to leverage that in our AMS migration as well. So creating a new account for us wasn't too big a deal with the exception of the IP space stuff I talked about earlier. So then when we handed it over to AMS, um, early on, because there's so much to do, it naturally took a couple of weeks for a um, landing zone to kind of go through the AMS process. And when we looked and we said, hey, we need 44 landing zones, um, and really quickly, uh, we knew that something needed to, to change. And AMS partnered, again, to bring their um, landing zone creation time from two weeks down just to a number of days. The other automation that kind of became apparent of, for, our, for our migration was in the infrastructure creation space, right? The, the core of how do you get all of these apps and servers up and running. So we had a couple different ways in a program this size of creating um, infrastructure, depending on the line of business or the category of application and kind of how we separated them out. But I want to show one to you today. We created a, for one of our lines of businesses, a framework using Troposphere, a Python framework that generates CloudFormation, um, to automate the process and more seamlessly move from that discovery phase into migration. The goal was to minimize the change that was needed for that input file so that we could apply this process to a whole number of applications and that would mean time savings for each migration. This process also included a tool to automate the process of doing change requests with AMS. All right, here's where we see if everything works. If the demo works. <laughs> um, with the infrastructure creation, it covered about 90% of this um, particular line of, of businesses portfolio. So it was, it was a huge benefit. It started with a JSON input file, giving us a consistent view of what was going into the process. The parameters at the top are largely application um, information, just metadata about the application, and they play into our tagging strategy. And I didn't talk about this yet, but a tagging strategy is essential to get done upfront and enforced upfront in any migration process. These tags identify which asset that server or other uh, resource in Amazon belongs to. That's how we do cost allocation. That's how we track down um, owners of applications. And then for us, we had a, a pretty, fairly robust tagging strategy up front because we'd been operating in the cloud for th two or three years now. And so we've been doing all of these things and our cloud native accounts were very familiar and, and we had um, ways to enforce tagging in those accounts, but we didn't 
get that up front. And I think we kind of figured, hey, we, we know tagging, we've done this before, here's our tagging standard, it's gonna apply to an AMS account as well. And, but because, again, of the natural distributed nature of it, and there were more than one way to create infrastructure for our program, we started out missing a lot of tags from a lot of applications. And what that meant was we had to create a new effort to go back and make sure that we applied all the right tags. So a bonus lesson learned. All right, so with the app metadata, we could also um, kind of define which uh, AWS account it was gonna, the infrastructure was gonna go into, which region, and you can also see that um, in the bottom we have different um, groups for different areas of the infrastructure, whether that's a security group um, for the load balancers, a security group for the EC2 infrastructure itself, obviously the definition of the servers we're gonna stand up, uh, the load balancer, and then DNS information. And we built this and added to it over the time. And it didn't have all the features that we needed right away. But we took an iterative approach. Okay, here's where it goes wrong. Yeah, okay, we're starting over. Even videos can be a challenge sometimes. All right, here's our security group load balancers. Our um, our security groups was an interesting one. So AMS gives you um, security groups out of the gate that allow access between everything in the VPC and that it gives access to each other. We um, chose a little bit more of a strict security group approach where we, by layers in the application and for each project, wrapped a security group around them. And so we, re we, re we would remove the security group uh, that AMS gave us by default and follow our own security group approach. The other thing that we did was, um, in, in the, on the screen right now, is uh, the definition of one of our EC2 instances. And this enabled us to weave in standards too. So encryption for EBS volumes. It, it wasn't a question, right? It just happened because it was baked into the tool. Kind of like that's the value we got out of the tagging bit as well. And then we created custom instance profiles too. So this goes to the minimum viable refactoring. By creating custom instance profiles, it helped us with deployment, but it also allowed us to set up the use of secrets manager for secrets, where if you just do a lift and shift and you ignore some of the minimum viable stuff, the minimum viable stuff that's actually pretty easy to accomplish, then you don't get that benefit. So at the end of the day, we improved our security posture and we got um, a little bit of value of some of the services at Amazon that makes our life easier. All right. Um, with load balancers, we supported um, all the different types of load balancers, network, application, and um, ELBs. And then the last one here, um, target groups for actual um, deployment of the infrastructure. And then um, Route 53, so from a DNS perspective, a lot of our cutovers, we're just using our current DNS system and switching over uh, that DNS record to point to the new load balancer in, in Amazon. We also supported Route 53 and different routing policies. And we just baked, we built on top of that as we went through our migration and encountered an app that needed additional requirements. So we started simple. And then uh, taking this input file then, we would execute the command to actually um, create the cloud formation, run the framework, upload to an S3 bucket, and then um, automatically submit an RFC that points to that pre-signed URL in S3 to actually create the infrastructure and deploy it. In this case, we pulled for five minutes and kept asking, hey, are you done yet, are you done yet? And gave feedback right to the command line. You can also see on the bottom that um, the, the console would be we updated with uh, the request for change status. But, um, but the main one was we gave that status right back to the, the command line. So like I said, for infrastructure creation, we found 
although it was a, a diverse set of applications, we did find those pockets of consistency. We used the automation for creating infrastructure, and then we used automation for deploying our applications, which can be a big amount of time if you talk about um, a, a mass migration like this. There were several applications that we didn't deploy very often, talking like less than once per year or once per two years. For those, we didn't spend a lot of time automating the app deployment. But for some of them that did actually get deployed more frequently, we did go through the process, again, in the same line of business for deploying on top of all of the different frameworks. So as you can see on the right here, we depend on Amazon Web Services, which then we build into Amazon Managed Services. We built our TR Troposphere framework to create our automation, and then now we have our app deployment framework as well. It supports multiple deployment types, and it also automated change requests. I'll show this to you next year. All right. So this was built on top of code build, code pipeline, and code deploy. So all of the standard config files apply. I'm not going to dive into the details of that. But we did allow uh, multi-region deployments. So in this case, giving the source of our artifact that we're going to actually deploy um, in our config, in our YAML config file, led into a code build job. Uh, here's our region. We did multi-region deployment um, through this process as well. Uh, we grouped the different sections of the application, so it could be the app tier or the web tier, and by naming conventions, we're able to easily identify those in the actual code, build deploy, uh, code deploy. We had a code um, build step that packages everything up, gets it to the right, creates the revision in code deploy, and stages the artifact for deployment. And then it feels very similar to the infrastructure pipeline, which when we actually execute it here, so before it was the code for the code build step, code build step. Now when we actually check in a change, push it to our Git repository, automatically kicked off the code build step to then key into the deployment pipeline. And now you can see that automated change request to do a code deploy was executed for, this is a Lynx application, and it's in progress. And for this one, we didn't automate that uh, status. We knew that it could take a while for a deployment depending on the application. So we just, um, you can look at the uh, RFC or the code deploy console to see the status of the deployments. So at the end of the day, the challenges that faced us with our data center exit were, were daunting. Um, AMS became a key partner uh, for us. They enabled us to migrate more quickly. There's no chance we'd be where we are today without AMS's support. We were able to get a workload to production much faster than without them. That allows us to focus on our differentiators, right, our products, uh, more quickly and get this migration complete more quickly. Our teams are already, because of this, getting uh, many benefits of the cloud, and even in this lift and shift, like I said, with a minimum viable refactoring process, it forced us to create migration plans for every application, so we have some consistent architectural documentation on applications we didn't have that vis visibility into before. One of our teams, uh, in fact, was gonna do a cutover a couple weeks ago, and the Friday before the cutover, the production cutover, all their users are going on Saturday. Uh, they started seeing connection reset errors. And as an example, they were able to, that application team by themselves, the morn, that Friday morning, were able to dig in, see that a load balancer configuration didn't make it to production where it was in the pre-pro, that's why we didn't discover it there, submit a request for change, Amazon Managed Services executed that, and they were ready by that afternoon and continue on their production code over. And that is where just the self-service nature of the cloud, even in a lift and shift, gave us a lot of value. So 
So um, now that we've completed, we, we are about, we started a year ago. Uh, we are about 60% complete with our migration to date. And with how everything's going, we're going to be 75% done by the end of the year. And we estimate 95% done by the end of Q1 next year. We're very pleased with that. And so now we can get on with our biggest, best, next value, which is modernizing our applications. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so there is a recap of all the lessons that we've learned over the last year with, with TR. They're in your presentation deck that you'll have access to if you want to review those. Um, I think uh, the, let me go back, sorry. I think the biggest lesson learned for us, um, not only in AMS, but in AWS in general and doing different migrations is that <clears throat> all of our customers are unique. You're moving to the AWS cloud for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's you're evicted from your data center. Don't worry, it's you, not them. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's to focus on modernization. Um, sometimes it's cost optimization. But what isn't unique is every customer has the same challenges migrating. Your customer itself is unique. Migration is not unique. Um, we see it across all of our customers. So don't, you know, if you're facing any of these challenges, whether it's speed, whether you want to automate, whether you want to modernize, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Matt and I's contact information is in the presentation as well. Um, so I'm sure if you want to stay, we have about five minutes for Q&A. Realize you have to probably hoof it halfway back across Vegas for your next session. Um, here are some related bre breakouts that you can attend um, or watch on YouTube. They'll all be posted. And then, uh, again, thanks for your time today. If you have questions, more than welcome to stay. We'll answer. Yep. Oh, thanks. <laughs>